Today we'll cover section 4.1, which is an introduction to apportionment. The mathematical investigation into apportionment, which is a method of dividing a whole into various parts, has its roots in the Constitution. Since 1790, when the House of Representatives first attempted to apportion itself, various methods have been used to decide how many voters would be represented by each member of the House of Representatives. In 1790, two competing plans were put forward, one by Alexander Hamilton and one by Thomas Jefferson. To illustrate how the Hamilton and Jefferson plans were used to calculate the number of representatives each state should have, we'll consider the fictitious country of Andromeda with a population of 20,000 and five states. So we're going to take a simpler example to understand the concepts. So Andromeda has five states, Apis, Libra, Draco, Cephas, and Orion. And the population of each state is given, and the total population of that country of Andromeda is 20,000 people. It so happens that Andromeda's constitution calls for 25 representatives to be chosen from among those five states. The number of representatives will be apportioned according to the state's respective populations. In other words, a bigger state should have more representatives, a smaller state should have fewer representatives. That's sort of the big idea. Both plans, that's Hamilton and Jefferson, require the calculation of the ideal number of people to be represented by each representative. And to do that, all you do is divide and get something called the standard divisor. The standard divisor is the total population of the state divided by how many representatives you want to have. In this case, the total population is 20,000 and the state will have 25 representatives. So 20,000 divided by 25 is 800. So ideally, you would have 800 people being represented by each representative. And that's an ideal. You're probably not going to hit it exactly. Now, let's apportion these representatives using the Hamilton plan. And by doing this, you'll see what the Hamilton plan actually is. Under the Hamilton plan, each state's population is divided by the standard divisor, and the quotient is rounded down to the nearest whole number. In other words, you divide and ignore the fractional part. Each of these whole number quotients is called a standard quota. So the standard divisor is the total population divided by the number of representatives. Each state will have its own standard quota, which is that state's population divided by the standard divisor and then rounded down. So let's do that. Going back and looking at that table, you can see that if we take each population and divide by 800, we get the following quotients. Apis has 13.904, Libra has 1.099, Draco has 4.398, Cephas has 1.954, Orion has 3.646. Hamilton's plan says to round them down, so you just chop off the fractional parts. So the standard quota for Apis would be 13, Libra would be 1, Draco would be 4, Cephas would be 1, Orion would be 3, and if you add up all of those standard quotas, you see that you get 22. We're looking for 25 representatives, though. It only gives us 22. So what do you do if you don't get enough? Here's the trick. With the Hamilton plan, you take whatever else you need and give it to the states with the largest fractional parts. Since we need three more representatives, we'll find the states with the three largest fractional parts. If you go back to the next to last column that says quotient, you'll see that the 0.954 is the largest fractional part, the 0.904 is the second largest fractional part, and the 0.646 is the third largest fractional part. So the three states associated with those quotients will get an extra seat. So APIS will get an extra seat, bumping it from 13 to 14 seats. Cephas will get an extra seat, bumping it from one to two. And Orion will get an extra seat, bumping it from three to four. And if you look now and add up those numbers, you indeed get 25. So Hamilton method may not hit the right number of representatives in the beginning, but whatever you're short by, you give them to the stage with the biggest fractional parts. That's the Hamilton plan. So again, using Hamilton's plan, the representatives are going to have 14 for APIS, 
one for Libra, four for Draco, two for Cephas, and four for Orion. Now let's do it again using the Jefferson plan. And by doing this, you will see what Jefferson's plan does. As we saw with the Hamilton plan, dividing by the standard divisor and then rounding down does not always yield the correct number of representatives. In the previous example, for instance, there were three representatives short. Jefferson plan attempts to overcome that problem by using something called a modified standard divisor. And you find it by trial and error. And you keep doing it until you get a sum of the standard quotas that is exactly the right number of representatives. So it's sort of a trial and error based on the original standard divisor and you keep guessing a modified standard divisor until you get the right number of seats apportioned. Of course, if the standard divisor gives the correct apportionment right away, then you don't even need a modified standard divisor. But most of the time it will not and you'll try to find a modified standard divisor that's smaller than the original standard divisor. Let's do the Jefferson plan. Remember from the last calculation that the standard divisor is 800, so we don't need to do that calculation again. But we do also remember that it only apportioned 22 representatives, but we need 25. That means we're short. So the Jefferson plan says, let's just guess a modified standard divisor that's smaller than 800 and see if we can get it to equal to 25. So for instance, you might just guess something smaller than 800, say 750. If you take these and divide each population by 750 instead of 800, you'll see that APIS comes out to be 14.831, which rounds down to 14. Libra comes out to be 1.172, which rounds down to 1. Draco comes out to be 4.691, which rounds down to 4. Cephas comes out to 2.084, which rounds down to 2. And Orion comes down to 3.889, which rounds down to 3. That only apportions 24 seats. So we didn't go small enough. So let's go a little bit lower than 750 and try it again. We're one short. Again, you're just guessing, but we're very close. I'm going to guess 740 instead of 750. And try again. And you'll find out that APIS comes out to be 15.8. 031, which rounds to 15. Libra comes out to be 1.188, which rounds down to 1. Draco comes out to be 4.754, which rounds down to 4. Cephas comes out to be 2.112, which rounds down to 2. Orion comes out to be 3.942, which rounds down to 3. And if you add those numbers up, bingo, you get 25. So by the Jefferson plan, once you find the right divisor so that the numbers add up to how many you're trying to apportion, you're done. So using Jefferson's plan, the representatives go as follows. Apis gets 15, Libra gets 1, Draco gets 4, Cephas gets 2, and Orion gets 3. So that's the Jefferson plan. This table shows you the two plans and their apportionment. Notice that the Hamilton plan is better for Orion because Orion gets four instead of three and the Jefferson plan is better for Apis because Apis then gets 15 instead of 14. But both plans apportion the 25 seats based on certain principles. Let's try another one. Suppose the 18 members on the board of the Reuben County Environmental Agency are selected according to the populations of the five cities in the county as shown in this table. So you've got Cardiff, Solana, Vista, Palma, and Pacific and their populations. Let's first do it by the Hamilton plan. The Hamilton plan tells us that we need to get the, in fact, both plans tells us that we have to have the standard divisor, which means we need the total population. So if you don't know the total population, you have to find it. And if you add up those, you'll find out it's 20,000. The standard divisor is the total population divided by the number of representatives. So that would be, in this case, 20,000 divided by 18. We're looking to have 18 members on this board. Also remember that standard quota is the whole number part of the quotient when you take the population and divide it by the standard divisor. And I want to say something about this. Sometimes the definition will say 
there's a state involved when actually there's a city involved or a county board involved. So the, the actual words that you use, it could be a state, it could be a city, it could be a board of education, it could be, well, as you see, it'll be, it can be any other number of things. You sort of have to be flexible in uh, understanding what these terms that we use, city, state, whatever, mean. And you'll see this as we go through it. First thing you do for either method is find the quotient. You take the population of each state and divide it by the standard divisor, and that gives you the standard quota for each state. Cardiff comes out to be 6.318, Solana comes out to be 2.187, Vista comes out to be 1.386, Palma comes out to be 3.348, Pacific comes out to be 4.761, and if you round down to get the standard quotas, you get Cardiff 6, Solana 2, Vista 1, Palma 3, Pacific 4, and if you add those numbers up, you'll see that you've only apportioned 16 seats. Using Hamilton's method, since you're too short, you just find the two quotients that have the biggest fractional part, and it turns out that Pacific has a fractional part of 7.61, so they're the top, and the next largest fractional part is the 3.86 of Vista, so both of those cities will get an extra seat and now if you add an extra seat to Vista giving Vista 2 and an extra seat to Pacific giving Pacific 5 and re-add the numbers you'll find out that you've got 18. So using Hamilton's method Cardiff gets 6, Solana gets 2, Vista gets 2, Palma gets 3, and Pacific gets 5. It's really pretty simple. Now let's apportion using the Jefferson plan. The standard divisor we've already calculated it's about a 1111.11. It only gave us 16, we need 18. So using Jefferson's method, we'll choose something slightly smaller and see what happens. So I'm going to guess 925. Nothing magical about that, just guess something smaller. I need two more seats, I'm just making up something. If you divide by 925, you get Cardiff's number being 7.589, Solana's 2.627, Vista being 1.665, Palma is 4.022, Pacific is 5.719, and if you round them down, and if you add them up, you get 19. Well, that's too many, so we went too far. So 925 was actually too small, so we need to go a little higher. So maybe I'll try 950 maybe, so I'll redivide using 950. This time, Carth comes out to be 7.389, Solana comes out to be 2.558, Vista comes out to be 1.621, Palma comes out to be 3.916, and Pacific comes out to be 5.568. If you round them down and add them, bingo, you've hit 18, that's what you were looking for. So under Jefferson's plan, the representatives are Card of 7, Solana 2, Vista 1, Palma 3, and Pacific 5. None of this is difficult, but you do need to practice. This brings up a topic of, of fairness, because if you're going to decide which plan to use, you've got to say, well, how do I choose? Which one is more fair? It's going to affect the number of representatives the state has, so obviously people are going to say, let's choose the fairest method. But what does it mean to be fair? It's true that mathematicians and a lot of other people have tried to develop criteria that can help us choose an apportionment methods fair, but you've got to get an agreement on what is fair. One criteria of fairness for an apportionment plan says that it should satisfy the quota rule. The quota rule says the number of representatives apportioned to a state is the standard quota or one more than the standard quota. It sounds reasonable. If you if you do the division, certainly a state shouldn't get more than one more seat than what you divided and found that it deserved. So that's a, that's a very nice goal. The Hamilton plan always satisfies the quota rule because that's the way you do the Hamilton plan. You either leave it when you divide it and round down or you add it at most one to a state to get the apportionment. So Hamilton method by definition follows the quota rule. However, the Jefferson plan does not. For example, it's certainly possible under the Jefferson plan that if you did the standard quota for a state and it came out to be seven, when you 
finish the whole process, that state could possibly have, for example, nine representatives. That could happen under the Jefferson plan. It could never happen under the Hamilton plan. So under the quota rule, the Hamilton plan would be fairer if you think the quota rule is what you should be shooting for. Now, that's not the only way to judge fairness. Another common measure of fairness that's not based on the standard quota is called the average constituency. The average constituency is simply the population of a state divided by the number of representatives from that state and then round it to the nearest whole number. So the average constituency is the state's population divided by the number of representatives from the state. And again, as I pointed out, I'm saying state, but it could be a city or a county or a club. Uh, the word state doesn't have to mean state. It can be other things. Let's do another example. Consider the two states, Hampton and Shasta, in the table below. Hampton has a population of 16,000. Shasta has a population of 8,340. Hampton has 10 representatives and Shasta has 5 representatives. To calculate the average constituency, you simply divide the population by the number of representatives for each state. So for Hampton, you take 16,000 divided by 10, and that gives you 1,600. And for Shasta, you take 8,300 divided by 5, and that gives you uh, 1,668. So Hampton has a slightly smaller average constituency than Shasta, and that means that a representative represents slightly fewer people in Hampton than in Shasta. But it's very close. Because they're so close, you would think that that's probably an indication that they're pretty well equally represented. Even though Hampton is smaller, it's very close. So in, in terms of the average constituency, you might be satisfied with that if you were either state. Now suppose for some reason we're going to add another representative to this mix. It's got to go to one of the two states. The question is, which state is more deserving of that new representative? In other words, if you want to be fair about it, who should get it? Should it be Hampton or should it be Shasta? One way to answer this question is to calculate the average constituency of each state, assuming that state receives the extra representative. So if you look at this, we already had Hampton having an average constituency of 1,600 and Shasta having an average constituency of 1,668. We'll call that the old average constituency. Now we're going to calculate a new one for Hampton and a new one for Shasta based on each one of those individually getting the extra seat. So let's suppose Hampton gets the extra seat. That means instead of having 10 representatives, Hampton has 11 representatives. So if you calculate the average constituency now, you get 16,000 divided by 11, which is about 1455. But now suppose the extra seat goes to Shasta instead. That means instead of having five representatives, Shasta now has six representatives. And if you take 8340 divided by six, you get about 1390. So under the possibility of Hampton getting another seat, you get a new average constituency. Under the possibility of Shasta getting an extra seat, you have a, no, a new average constituency. And that table documents what we just did. So looking at that, can you decide now which state or which one do you think is going to deserve that extra seat? What's the fairest way to do it? One way is to compare the average constituencies when Hampton gets the seat versus when Shasta gets the seat. In other words, look at what would happen. If Hampton gets the seat, let's think of that as one row of a table. And if Shasta gets the seat, we've got another row of the table. And let's look at what happens in each case. Suppose Hampton gets that extra seat. That means that its average constituency now is 1455. But if Hampton got the seat, that means that Shasta didn't get the seat, so Shasta stayed the same. Shasta still has the old average consistency of 1668. So if Hampton gets a seat, its average constituency is from the last column, and that's 1455. But Shasta stayed the same, so its average constituency comes from the middle column, which is 1668. Now suppose Shasta gets a seat. So if Shasta gets a seat, Hampton is still at its old constituency of 1600. 
but Shasta goes over to its new constituency of 1390. So you see where those numbers come from? You make the assumption that Hampton gets a seat and look at the two average constituencies, and then you assume that Shasta gets a seat and you do the same thing. And that table above helps you organize your work. So let's look at the differences. If you take the difference between 1668 and 1455, you'll find that's a difference of 213. And if you take the difference between 1600 and 1390, you'll find out that's 210. And it turns out that when we're doing this, we don't care about positive versus negative. We're, just, we're always going to subtract so we get a positive number. We're just looking at the absolute difference. We don't care about signs, so it's always going to be positive. So just subtract so it's going to be the largest minus the smallest each time. So at first glance, it might seem to be most fair to give the seat to the state which would have the smallest difference in average constituencies, and that would give it to Shasta. But think about it a minute. That's not necessarily true. Think about real life and comparing a big state like California in the United States to Rhode Island. Giving one extra seat to a humongous state like California is hardly even noticeable, but giving one extra seat to Rhode Island is very noticeable. In fact, in the House of Representatives, Rhode Island only has two representatives, so if Rhode Island got a third representative, that would be a 50% increase. That would be huge for Rhode Island. California has so many already, it would hardly even be noticeable. So looking at those absolute differences is probably not the fairest way to do it. You sort of want to think of them as percentages, and that leads to a concept called the relative unfairness, not the absolute unfairness, but the relative unfairness of an apportionment. And what you do there, and there's the formula, it looks more daunting than it is. It says take the absolute value of the difference in the average constituencies between the two states and divide by the average constituency of the state getting the new representative. All that means is up top, you get one of those differences we calculated in the last column of that table in the middle of the screen. And down bottom, you divide by the average constituency of the state that got the new representative. So it looks a little daunting, but really, it's the difference from the table divided by the average constituency of the state that got the new rep. And it makes it into a percentage. The relative size of the state gets, count, gets accounted for as well. So let's use this relative unfairness idea and see what it looks like with Hampton and Shasta. Because there are two possible states that could get the seat, we'll end up computing the relative unfairness twice, once when the seat goes to Hampton and once when it goes to Shasta, and we'll choose the one that gives the smallest relative unfairness. So it'll be two calculations and we pick the smallest. Again, I mentioned this before, but the absolute value sign in the numerator just means that we subtract so that it's always positive. Whichever number is larger minus whichever is smaller, that'll give us a positive number each time. So, let's take case one. Suppose Hampton gets that extra seat. The relative unfairness is the difference we calculated on the Hampton row. Just cover up Shasta. You don't care about Shasta now. This is Hampton getting the extra seat. So you take the difference and put it in the numerator, and you divide it by the state that got the extra seat, and we're assuming that Hampton got it. So you divide by the average constituency of Hampton. If you do that division, you get about 0.146. Now let's go to case two, which is that it flips, and instead Shasta gets the seat. Now we don't care about the Hamilton row. Shasta gets the seat. The relative unfairness now, again, is the difference from the third column, which is the 210, divided by the average constituency of the state that got the new representative, and we're assuming that Shasta got it, so it would come to the Shasta number, which is the 1390. So it's 210 divided by 1390, and that comes out to be about 0.151. So if you look at this, Hampton has a slightly smaller relative unfairness, and this leads to something called the apportionment principle. So the apportionment principle says when you add a new representative to a state, the representative goes to the state that has the smallest relative unfairness. It seems logical now under the apportionment principle to give the extra seat to Hampton because Hampton has a smaller relative unfairness than Shasta does. So we're going to give that seat to Hampton. Let's do another example. Not only just practice and emphasize step by step how this is done, but also to show you how wide a variety of problems this apportionment idea can apply to. 
For example, here we're talking about paramedics in two different cities. Think of the paramedics as the, as the representatives that we're trying to apportion between the two cities. So even though it's t two cities and not two states, and it's paramedics instead of representatives, the ideas are the same. Apportioning representatives to states is the same calculation as apportioning paramedics to two cities. So, in any case, there are two cities, Tahoe and Erie. Tahoe has 125 paramedics. Erie has 143 paramedics. Tahoe has an annual number of paramedic calls of 17,526. Erie has 22,461. And we want to use that information to decide if one paramedic is hired, who gets that paramedic, Tahoe or Erie. Using the apportionment principle, we have to calculate the average constituency. That's the first step. The average consistency, remember, is just the population of the state. In this case, it's a city, not a state, but nevertheless, divided by the number of representatives from the state. Again, we don't use representatives here. We're doing paramedics. So it's the number of paramedics from the city. So even though we're using state and representatives, you've got to make sure you can translate. This is actually the city annual paramedic calls up top divided by the number of paramedics from each city. For Tahoe, that would be 17,526 divided by 125. That's about 140. For Erie, it would be 22,461 divided by 143. That's approximately 157. Now remember, we're going to recalculate the average constituency for each city, assuming one at a time that each city gets that extra paramedic. So we start off and we'll do Tahoe first. If Tahoe goes from 125 paramedics to 126, their average constituency number changes from 140 to 139, approximately. If you give that extra seat, though, to Erie and add to 143, it becomes 144, and the new calculation for the average constituency for Erie becomes about 156. What next? I would use these calculated average constituencies to build a table like I did earlier. One row is when Tahoe gets a paramedic. The second row is when Erie gets a paramedic. What do these numbers mean? I said Tahoe 139 on the first row and Erie 157 on the first row. And when Erie gets a paramedic, I said Tahoe 140 and Erie is 156. You've got to remember where these things come from. So let's just take a minute. The 139 for Tahoe on the first row is because we assume that Tahoe got the paramedic. So if Tahoe got the paramedic, you've got to pull the average constituency from the new column. That's the column where Tahoe got the extra paramedic. But staying on that first row, Erie didn't get the paramedic, so Erie's average constituency stays at its original number, which was 157. So you've got to read this very carefully. Be careful. On the next row, if Erie got the paramedic, then you have to read the Erie number from the new average constituency column, which is 156. Tahoe did not get the paramedic on the second column, so Tahoe's number stays at 140 from the original column. Be careful. Once you get these numbers, now you can calculate the difference. The difference, if Tahoe gets a paramedic, is 157 minus 139, which is 18. And the difference, if Erie gets a paramedic, is 156 minus 140, which is 16. And remember, we just always subtract so the bigger numbers first. We always want to get positive differences. The fifth step is to calculate the relative unfairness for each possibility, for each row. Because there are two possible cities that could get the extra paramedic, we've got to do it twice. And remember the formula is the difference up top divided by the average constituency of the state that got the new representative. So let's take them one at a time. Suppose Tahoe gets the extra paramedic. Just completely cover up the Erie row. If Tahoe gets the paramedic, the relative unfairness is the difference, which is 18, divided by the average constituency of Tahoe, because Tahoe got the paramedic, and that'd be 139. If you divide, that's about 0.129. 
Now go to case two, which is Erie gets the extra paramedic, so you're not worried about Tahoe at all. So you look at the second row. You calculate the relative unfairness by using the difference, which is 16 this time, divided by the average constituency of Erie, which happens to be 156. And if you divide that, you get about 0.103. And if you compare those two, 0.103 is smaller. You choose the one with the smallest relative unfairness using the apportionment principle. And that tells you that Erie should get the extra paramedic. You really need to practice these things. They're not difficult, but you have to practice. We mentioned earlier that the U.S. House of Representatives has used various apportionment plans over the years, including but not limited to both the Jefferson and Hamilton plans. But what method is used right now? Do you know? It's actually not either one of those. It's a method called the Huntington Hill method, and it's been used since 1940. It's actually based on the apportionment principle. Sometimes it's called the method of equal proportions but it's also well known as the Huntington Hill Method. The Huntington Hill Method is based on what is called a Huntington Hill number, and as mentioned, it's derived from the apportionment principle that we talked about earlier. And this is it. The Huntington Hill number is defined as P sub A squared over A times A plus one, where P sub A is the population of state A, and little a is the current number of representatives from that state. You take the population of the state and square it and divide by the product of the number of representatives that state has times the number of representatives plus one. That is called the Huntington Hill number. And this leads to the Huntington Hill apportionment principle, which says if you're going to add a representative, give it to the state with the biggest Huntington Hill number. So it's actually fairly simple. And the best way to illustrate it is through an example. This table shows the number of lifeguards that are assigned to three different beaches and the number of rescues made by lifeguards at those beaches. Use the Huntington Hill apportionment principle to determine to which beach a new lifeguard should be assigned. So this is sort of like the paramedic problem earlier, but we're going to use the Huntington Hill method to do the assignment. The first step is to calculate that Huntington Hill number for each beach. Remember, it's the population of the state, or in this case, the beach, squared, divided by the number of representatives, in this, in this case it's the number of lifeguards, times the number of lifeguards plus one. So let's do it for each state. For Mellon, the number of rescues is like the population, it's analogous, that's 1227 squared, divided by the number of lifeguards, which is 37 times 37 plus one, so it'd be 37 times 38. So if you take 1,200 27 and square it and then divide it by the product of 37 and 38, you'll get about 1,071. Try it yourself and be sure you can get that number. Then if you move to Donovan Beach, the number of rescues is 1473, so you square that number and put it in the numerator, and you take the number of lifeguards, which is 51 times 51 plus 1, which becomes 51 times 52 in the denominator, so if you divide that out, you'll get about 818. And finally, you move to Ferris Beach, and the number of rescues is 889, so you square that, and the number of lifeguards is 24, so in the denominator, you get 24 times 25. If you do that calculation, you'll get about 1317. So according to the, according to the Huntington Hill apportionment principle, you will take the state with the biggest Huntington Hill number and give that state the representative, or in this case, you'll give that beach the new lifeguard. Ferris has the biggest Huntington Hill number, so Ferris should get the extra lifeguard. Now that we looked at various apportionment methods, we might ask, which is the best? Unfortunately, you can't really answer that. All apportionment methods have some flaws, and that was actually proven by Michael Belinsky and Peyton Young in 1982. It's called the Belinsky-Young Impossibility Theorem, which basically says any apportionment method is subject to either violating the quota rule or producing some other 
unwanted paradoxical result. In other words, there's no one method that you can say that's, that's always the fairest way to do it. Such is life. Although there is no perfect apportionment method, Valensky and Young presented a strong case that the Webster method, which is actually something we didn't discuss, does most closely satisfy the goal of one person, one vote. So if you're interested in this, you might Google the Webster method and, and look more into that. Because there are lots of these. We only took a sampling. And we especially wanted to do the Huntington Hill method because that's the current method for doing the House of Representatives that we use today.